Hello, I'm Jérôme Plateau, VR Director of the Special Project Team. Welcome to the talk Matrix Awakens, Creating a World. Epic has been pushing the limit of real-time rendering and demonstrating that Unreal Engine can be used for many types of projects, from interactive experience to linear content. This year, we have created the experience name Matrix Awakens. Let's look at the teaser and then I'll go over the goals and the ideas behind the project. I'm Thomas Anderson. Like many of you, I work with computers. But computers are also mirrors, reflecting back who and what we are and the choices we make, the worlds we build. You still got it. Okay, so let's go over the goals. First of all, we want to make sure Unreal Engine is ready for open world experience. Being able to stream large environment and have all the tools ready to manage such a big amount of data. Then, of course, we want to use Nanite and Lumen for man-made environment like a city. We also have to create a new mass AI system to populate the world with crowd and car traffic. Then we use the meta sound system to bring everything to life. Like every year, we want to keep pushing our meta-human technology, like the way we render it and also the way we capture it. Then we want to keep pushing our physics system chaos to simulate the car physics, the crashes, and the destructions. Another important part is that we wanted to utilize the gameplay system to generate cinematic content. For example, the cinematic artists could use the playable cars and record themselves driving around the city and use those texts for cinematic shots. We also wanted to push our procedural tools and workflow so that a relatively small team can generate and populate a large-scale environment. Then, we wanted this incredible experience to run on consumer hardware and put it in people's hands. We had to make sure that everybody who owns the next-gen consoles can see what Unreal Engine is capable of and prove that those innovative technologies are available right now for anybody who wants to use Unreal Engine 5 for their project. Over the years, we've been creating tech demos to showcase the latest engine features, but most importantly, is to make sure that those new tools have been tested on real production. Now that we have established the goals, let's see what are the ideas behind the demo. We got in touch with Lana Wachowski just before she started to film The Matrix Resurrection. We talked about the project with her, and she was ready to jump on it right after she finished filming the movie. The Matrix universe was a perfect match for us to talk about the future of graphics and simulated world. The key part was that we wanted to blur the lines between cinema and game. The experience starts with a mix of real-time cinematic and live-action photography. Then, little by little, we added more and more gameplay. Then we finished on the open world, where the player can go back and explore the entire city where the experience just happened. Now that the demo has been published and Unreal Engine 5 has been released, we want to give away the entire city to the Unreal Engine community. You can download the full project in the Epic Launcher in the Unreal Engine Marketplace. All the assets are available for free and you can reuse them for your own project. Let's go over a few numbers. The city is made of thousands of modular pieces. Those pieces have on average 50,000 to 500,000 polygons. All the assets are nanite, except when they are being deformed or need to have transparent shaders. On the texture side, we try to stick with 4K texture resolution. If we need more resolution, we break the UVs into several UDIMs and add more 4K textures. All the textures are converted to virtual textures. And of course, like most of our projects, we try to leverage the awesome Megascan library. I'm going to hand it over to Voch, who is going to dive deeper into the project. Hello, my name is Voch Levi. I'm a senior technical artist in the Special Projects group at Epic Games. Today, I'm going to take you on a tour of the asset and content pipeline we use to create the city in The Matrix Awakens. The first thing we did was discuss what we wanted the city to look like. 
an urban cityscape with tall skyscrapers and two main city sections. We wanted a detail-rich city with a variety of iconic buildings throughout the city. We drew inspiration from San Francisco, Chicago, and New York. We looked for buildings with intricate detail at both the bird's eye and also at the street level. We also wanted buildings we could mix and match using the upper section of one building with the lower section of another. We also identified specific building and street props, signage that we liked, awnings, you know, anything that we could fit onto the facade wall of a building. We identified 24 unique buildings, 10 Chicago, 8 New York, and 6 San Francisco themed. We also included one building from the Quixel Megascans library to ensure our system and tools would work with module buildings from any source. With our buildings and props identified, the next step is to build a content library in Unreal. This library would feed the Houdini-based procedural city generator. The results of the city generator would then be brought back into Unreal to create the final city result. We now break down our asset pipeline into its individual components. We have our content library, which feeds the Houdini city generator. We then return into Unreal, where we spawn the results of the city generator. The first assets we started building in the content library were our buildings. Utilizing Nanite, we wanted to capture as much geometry detail as possible. We included building imperfections, wear, damage, and bevels in the base geometry, no displacement required. All this detail meant it would be prohibitive to construct the buildings as a single static mesh. The triangle count would be incredibly high. And while Nanite could handle the triangle counts, a single static mesh would limit our ability to create building variations. We went back to the reference and took a closer look in keeping the ideal Nanite workflow in mind. Buildings have a lot of repetition in windows and walls and are a perfect case for instancing. We wanted to be able to reuse the buildings as much as possible to create detail and variation across the city. We devised a plan to slice the buildings into individual modular components. If we slice them just right, we would be able to instantiate the modules into an unlimited amount of unique building shapes. So we took the reference images and started defining the modules required to make the buildings. We organized the modules by level with a consistent cut line. All modules within a level would be exactly the same height. It's just a construction block game. Super easy, right? Well, buildings are complex and have a lot of unique features. And it's these features that make our reference buildings look interesting. To capture all the detail requires a lot, I mean a lot, of unique modules. While slicing up the buildings, we started to realize that even the simple buildings had hidden complexity. Real world buildings are built to fit within a specific terrain or location. We found that features in the building often varied from one side of the building to the other. From a distance, the modules all appear to be the same size. But actually, many modules that look the same are many feet different in width. And none of the buildings had a base module size that matched a consistent grid. We reduced the overall module count by consolidating modules with similar size. We merged columns and windows, or made double wide modules whenever possible. We felt it was the variety of detail and the inconsistencies of size and shapes that made these reference buildings look interesting. So we strive to retain all modules with differences in detail so that we could recreate the buildings as close to the original as possible using our base modules. Once we had all the module shapes defined for a building style, we used a custom-built module template generator to create a proxy version of each module. The template generator also allowed for defining additional metadata for the module, including module name, variation, floor, and dimensions. All the module templates are organized into a building kit that represents all the modules required to recreate the building. We used these templates as a starting point to create each building style and began prototyping the procedural building. We also use these template modules as a starting point in Maya to create high resolution geometry. The templates represented the base shape and dimensions of the module, but not necessarily the bounding box of the module. Additional features could push out from the bounds of the template geometry. This is why we opted to use dimensions derived from the template geometry rather than rely on bounding boxes of the high resolution geometry for module dimensions. Many of the buildings have hundreds of template modules and hundreds of high res modules. In order to keep our assets consistent and our team sane, we developed a custom importer to batch import the building modules, create the necessary folder structures, 
and create and assign material instances for each module. For more information on this tool, please check out our talk on building look development. In total, we created 24 unique buildings for a combined 2,333 unique high-res meshes, 2,558 unique textures, and a whopping 5,707 material instances. It's a lot of data, and we needed a way to keep it all organized. I've mentioned kits a few times so far. So what the heck is a kit? Think of it like a lens kit or a shaving kit. A kit is a single location to organize all of the building modules, a quick way to review the module's geometry, the look development, and to see how all the pieces fit together to make a building. These kits lasted the entire life of the project and were used as the work area to develop the buildings. So what exactly are the building modules? We defined a base set of modules, corner, wall, and entrance. This base set could be used to create any basic building. We also added some additional modules required to lay out more complex facades. Wall caps are designed to finish off a repeating wall module segment and are often polarized for the left or right side of the building. Transition modules sit in between two modules that may be offset from each other. They are also designed to be scaled to fit gaps. Pillars and columns are specific features that may go between window or wall modules and should not be scaled at all. Corners are broken into a few separate modules. The base corner modules are interior and exterior and are required for buildings with 90 degree or square corners. We also defined split left and right corner modules to support acute and obtuse corners. Split corners seem like a perfect solution. However, they only work for flat edge corners. Details that extend past the corner will penetrate on obtuse angles and will create gaps on acute angles. To avoid gaps, we developed a new corner type we call corner caps. Corner caps act almost like a hinge and are aligned to the average angle of both the left and right wall segments. In most cases, we were able to reuse 90 degree corners as corner caps, but on building styles with lots of facade detail, we had to create custom corner caps. We also found that corner caps offered another level of additional detail and variation, especially on building targets that contain lots of corners. Now that we have all our building modules defined, we need to assemble them to create a facade. We wanted artists to have control over how the facades would be procedurally generated. So we created an expression language we called Shape Grammar that describes the construction of a facade wall. Shape Grammar allows for explicit placement of building modules, but also supports repeating segments, looping segments, and defining which modules can be scaled. Shape Grammar also supports describing vertical segments of a building. Ground level, in blue, is the base of a building and is explicitly placed. Red segments are also explicitly placed and cannot be repeated. Green levels can be repeated. The last level in purple is a topper and placed to finish the vertical segment at the top of the building. The vertical shape grammar defines which levels can be repeated, which part of the building can be split into different styles, and how to finish a wall segment by placing a topper module. To find out more about shape grammar, check out our procedural tech talk. To achieve aesthetic placement of building props, we opted to hand place prop anchors on modules. Props are registered to modules and groups that allow for random selection of a prop anchor during procedural city generation. Props are organized by type, awning, light fixture, sign, and by brand, bank, burger joint, hotel, in our prop library. When a building is procedurally generated, a random prop brand is selected for the building facade. When an individual prop is placed on a building, a random selection of variations is chosen from each prop type. Keeping track of module metadata became incredibly important. As mentioned earlier, bounding box dimensions alone are not a reliable method to determine module size. We use the Houdini template generator to create all the module metadata and store the module information. Houdini Engine converted the module attributes to tags and stored them on the static mesh object where the metadata could be easily retrieved later down in the pipeline. Pivot location is also a critical path and crucial to keep consistent. We decided to place the pivot on the left side of a module aligned to the forward leading edge of a wall facade. With the pivot aligned to the wall, we would always know where the wall existed on the facade. However, this did create some challenges. For modules that did not have a forward-facing wall, like a recessed entrance or a stepped-back wall, 
we still place the pivot where the phantom wall would have been. All of the module information, including shape grammar and level grammar, is recorded in a JSON formatted building definition file. This file was saved externally from Unreal Engine and used by Houdini to construct a procedural building. We thought of the PDF files as the building style, as it represented everything required to construct a building of a particular style. So far in the asset pipeline, we have defined how the building modules and the building props content was created. We have imported into Unreal and organized the content into kits. We have assigned metadata and registered props to the building modules and generated a building definition file that contains all the information required to define a building style. At this point, we are ready to send the file over to the procedural system and generate a building. Procedural buildings can be generated in both Houdini and Unreal Engine using the City Building Generator, HDA. We relied heavily on the building generator in Unreal Engine at all phases of building development to ensure our modeling, materials, and look dev was set up to work properly in the procedural system. Please check out the procedural city generation for more talk on the building generator. We also hand authored collections of props to scatter around the city at street level and on the rooftops of buildings. We called these hand authored assets biomes. We hand authored the biomes using a new Unreal Engine 5 feature called level instant packed blueprints. Packed blueprints can be created from any selection of actors. The selection is exported into a newly created level that contains only the selection, and a packed blueprint is generated from that level, all automatically. All actors are converted to ISM components within the packed blueprint. A really nice feature in this workflow is the ability to place a packed blueprint in a level and then edit it in place. We use the packed blueprint workflow to author all biomes, hero buildings, and hero areas of the city. Hero buildings and biomes are also fed into the city generator for procedural placement around the city. With our source content pipeline complete, we are now ready to generate all the buildings in the city. To see how that's done, check out the procedural tech talk. Once the city is generated, a point cloud is saved into an Alembic file. We call the Alembic file a PBC as it only contains point information and any procedurally generated geometry required to create the buildings, streets, and collision objects. It's not a fully formed Alembic file that contains the full city. It's, all, it's just points and data. We bring this PBC back into Unreal and spawn the city using the rule processor. Spawning the city is a complex task. The city contains thousands of buildings, props, roads, decals, biomes, information to build a traffic system, parked cars, and place audio around the city. It's a tremendous amount of information. So how did we spawn the city and manage all of these actors? Welcome to Open World. Open World is a new set of tools in Unreal Engine 5 that allow for managing large, complex worlds and for efficiently streaming these worlds at runtime. The two main features in the new Open World Toolkit are World Partition and One File Per Actor. World Partition is a grid system that allows for the loading and unloading of actors in Editor and spatially at runtime. It removes the necessity of sublevels and complex logic to set up when areas of the world are active. One file per actor separates the connection between actors and levels and allows for multiple people to work on a level at the same time. One file per actor also works in conjunction with world partition to enable loading and unloading of individual actors. World partition also introduces a new organizational system called data layers. Data layers are essentially a way to group content with a common label that can be toggled on or off and streamed at runtime when world partition streaming cells are turned on or off. In the editor, world partition improved workflows and iteration times massively for our content team by allowing them to only load the streaming cells and data layers that they needed at any given moment. One file per actor stores each actor in the map as its own file on disk, which means when we edit the world, data contention between team members is at a minimum because only a minimal set of data is locked. For instance, I'd only have to load the single cell or data layer containing the stop sign and check out only that one actor to make the change, and I wouldn't have to lock other folks out of an entire sublevel. Level instances are also a new feature in World Partition. They offer a level-based workflow 
that facilitates the porting of non-world partition worlds into a world partition system. They offer a fast workflow for creating pack blueprints. Pack blueprints are great because they, they allow artists to abstract work from the main world partition map and work in an isolated area, creating content that can then be brought into the world partition map and edited in context. The large city is roughly four kilometers square. This is not a constraint of open world. We chose the city size for creative reasons only. There are a total of 101,959 actors in the world partition map. This count does not include traffic, crowds, or any other runtime elements. This number represents individual actors saved as one file per actor. Total instances contained in all ISM components is 8 million 556,732. This is all the building modules, props, stickers, roads, traffic lights, decals, everything that is instantiated in the city. Data layers are split into runtime and editor components. Runtime data layers have the ability to be controlled by logic at runtime, and editor data layers are used for world management in editor only and have no runtime overhead. World partition for the large city is set up with a main grid and two HLOD grids. The main grid contains everything within 128 meters from the player. This includes all the original actors that are placed in editor. Data layers can be used to control the loading and unloading of actors at runtime. HLOD zero, represented in blue, is the grid range extending up to 768 meters. All cells within the range from 128 meters to 768 will load HLOD0 with respect to data layers. HLOD0 contains four actors that are generated per cell. All the actors in the main grid cell are merged into four separate actors and consolidated into ISM components. This reduces the overall actor count and improves streaming of the cells. Since HLOD0 is generated from the main grid actors, Whenever a change is made to the actors in the main grid, HLOD0 will need to be regenerated. We used an automated process to regenerate HLOD0 every night. HLOD1, represented in red, is visible past the 768 meter range and is always loaded in memory. HLOD1 takes all the static meshes in a cell and merges them into a single nanite mesh, just like HLOD0, any changes to the main grid will require regeneration of HLOD1. All handcrafted and procedurally generated buildings are constructed using ISM components. This reduced overall actor count in the city and improved streaming performance. We did split all the buildings into upper and lower sections to improve collision. The lower ground section of a building uses articulate collision objects per building module to allow for detailed collision. This allows players to walk into recessed entrances of buildings and also walk through covered hallways and corridors. These collision objects are nested within the static mesh for each module and instanced along with the module inside the ISM component. For the upper section of buildings, we disabled collision on the building modules, a separate primitive collision object that represented the entire collision section is placed as a separate actor. This allowed for only evaluating a single primitive collision object for the entire upper section of a building. To improve ray tracing performance, we set up ray tracing groups per building. This helped optimize the lumen surface cache and allows all the pieces of a building to be called together. When setting up the groups, avoid including sparse objects. The goal of the group is to group objects that are close together. To further improve ray tracing performance, we made sure there was very little overlap of meshes. Hardware ray tracing gets slow when meshes are kit patched together and have lots of internal occlusions and penetrations. We booleaned all of our building modules to remove any dirty geo. Lumen traces mesh instances close to the camera and then relies on HLOD1 for everything else, allowing GI over huge distances. Now that we understand open world, it's time to set up the rule processor and spawn the city. The rule processor is a set of tools that allow for importing point data via an Alembic file. This point data could come from any source. 
For this project, we exported Olympic point data from Houdini and also from Unreal Engine for use with the rule processor. The rules can be very simple. For each point, spawn an actor. Or the rules can be complex. If a point is an upper level building module, assign it to the building data layer, disable collision, and set the window primitive data. The rule processor is fast and able to process millions of points very quickly. We were able to respawn the entire city around 50 times throughout the project. And often we respawn the entire city multiple times per day. We set up multiple rules for ingesting the city based on how we wanted to organize actors in the world. Buildings have a set of very specific rules that are different from actors that make up the roads and freeways. Setting up separate rules for different assets that made up the city allowed us to only regenerate those specific assets when things changed, further speeding up the process. The rule processor keeps track of actors that have been spawned and automatically cleans up old actors. It's also smart and recycles actors to reduce adds and deletes when using source control. The rule processor is also able to look up metadata key values and apply that data to actors as attribute overrides. This was helpful for setting up actors with specific needs like mesh decals and collision objects. The metadata required for setting up the interior windows was also procedurally generated and set up on actors as per instance primitive data. The city is spawned and ready for gameplay. This project was an absolute joy to work on. Before coming to Epic, I worked in the film industry for 20 years. And this is the first project I've worked on that didn't rely on a render farm to produce final frames. Working with assets at this level of detail, fidelity, and complexity in real time was something I never would have imagined was possible just a few years ago. And every time I fire up my workstation and open up this city map, it blows my mind what we're able to do now. Thanks for watching this video. And if you want to know more about how this city was produced, please check out our procedural tech talk. Hey, I'm Scott Clifford, and I'm a principal technical artist in the special projects group at Epic Games. In this section, I'll be showing you some of the techniques as well as Unreal Engine 5 features that contributed to the look and feel of the Matrix Awakens city environment. Okay, fellow friends of Unreal, here we go. As we narrowed in on the content for the Matrix Awakens, we were faced with populating a city with buildings. We wanted these buildings not only to have the complex model detail we can support with Nanite, but also high levels of realistic shading detail across a variety of architectural styles. So we start, as all good look dev does, with some photo reference of the style of a building that fits the project. Here's an example of the entrance of a building we chose for reference. This building not only needs to look good from this scale, but it needs to look good at the scale of a city. It also needs to look good from a human scale, and possibly even from an arm's length scale. Oh yeah, and there are 18 buildings that we've scouted and would like to include in our city. As Vach spoke about earlier, after we break the building down, we're not talking about just shading a building. We're talking about shading modular pieces of a building. For instance, good old building CHD has 72 modules in its kit. But that's kind of a simple building. CHC has 226 modules. And NYA, 485 modules. So we end up with over 2,000 individual pieces of buildings that need shading. Challenge accepted. Our goals are to minimize repetition, create textures for thousands of module assets with a small team, accommodate all possible module arrangements, and maintain our PBR values in our final materials. Not so fast. Anytime we want to do look dev, we need to have a calibrated lighting setup that we trust to make judgments about the work we're doing. This is a topic that could be its own tech talk in itself, but some of the things that we consider are what kind of HDRI we're using for our, our sky illumination, what is the key fill ratio of the sun to the sky, and how does that relate to what we see in the HDRI, what are our post-process volume settings, and many other details that you can check out in the city sample asset pack where we include this calibrated lighting setup. So now let's break down the look. When doing look dev on a model, we can break the process down into three distinct phases. The first step phase is where we address the base substance. What is this model made of? Then we break it down to the manufacturing process. How has the process that this building was made or assembled with affected its look? Finally, how has the environment changed this building since it's been manufactured? 
So let's start with our base substance. Base substances are created by gathering a library of tiling textures that we start with from Quixel Megascans. We adjust these textures to possibly remove repetition or add features, and then we export them as packed 4K RGBA images. We import these images as virtual streaming textures into the engine. When we use virtual streaming textures, we remove limits on the number of textures that we have in memory, so we're free to call as many textures as we want, and then we can manage that texture performance by tuning the streaming pool size per compression type. We then can create a UE material where we apply these textures as world aligned or triplanar, and we use realistic scaling to maintain the detail at a believable scale. So here we are, we get our first glimpse of where we're going. The building modules are assembled into coherent buildings where we can start to test our work in our calibrated lighting level. Warning, even though we don't have anything close to a finished material here, it's important that we start to sanity check our albedo, roughness, specular, and other values with each layer of the material. I like to do this by keeping the pixel inspector open and comparing what the reference values for things like base color and the G buffer are to values that I know. So this is where we are. Doesn't look great, but we have a starting point. So let's give ourselves a check for our base substance and move on to our manufacturing. The manufacturing details, such as mortar lines and block color variation, can be derived from two block pattern maps. Block variation, which gives each brick in the pattern a different value, and mortar lines, which shows where the blocks are joined. At this point, we could decide to fire up a 3D paint package, hand off these textures, and have our poor texture artists paint these maps onto all 2000 building modules. However, what we'd end up with is every module having the same pattern in every place it's used. This doesn't give us variation when the same module is used many times in a building, which was one of the goals we started with. So maybe there's another way. Before we get to that, we also added a couple crevice masks to the block patterns where staining or drips might be heavier. We'll use these later when we consider how fabrication details affect the environment's influence on our look. So we take our block pattern textures and combine them into a single 4K packed texture using BC7 texture compression. We use this compression to try to maintain as much detail in each channel and avoid channels bleeding together during the compression process. We carefully inspect all our reference and determine that we would need a collection of five stone block patterns and three brick patterns to cover the architectural style found in our city. But how are we going to store all these patterns? Let's talk about UDIM textures for a second. UDIM is simply an automatic UV offset system that assigns an image into a specific UV tile. So the mapping between the number that is found in the image file name is then used to offset that image into UV space. This allows us to use multiple low resolution texture maps producing a higher resolution result without using a single ultra high resolution image. UE supports UDIM texture imports and stores them as virtual textures. We take our block patterns and each pattern gets 10 variations in a 2x5 grid. Each variation has identical bricks at the left and right edges. This is going to help solve the problem of building modules that are aligned next to each other. We line up these 2x5 grids in a single 10x5 UDIM virtual texture. It's time to UV the modules. What we do here is a trim sheet approach where we carefully unwrap our modules and lay out the UV islands on our giant UDIM block pattern with the goal of producing modules with fabrication details that can seamlessly tile with multiple different neighbors. We lay out all islands in the bottom row. They will be procedurally offset into the other variation rows in the material. We use style columns that are two tiles wide, so module islands could be large and cross the border of two tiles. Most modules use two to three types of block to achieve the right structure. Now, in our material, we add functionality to use these block pattern UDIM textures for mortar line color, also for per block base substance variations of color and normal. We use per instance random to pick different rows of UDIMs and remove block variation and repetition. We end up with four UDIM virtual textures that provide all the brick and block patterning for all 2000 plus building modules. Using 4K tiles for the block pattern in UDIM provides very high texel density for fine details like mortar lines, which can be seen in the image on the left. Being creative with the UV layout allows artists to add complex structure to very intricate geometry. And variation is automatically built in to every building. So, let's see how we're doing. 
Here's our reference against our first two layers of our material, which include the base substance and the manufacturing detail. Not bad. So let's give ourselves a check for that, and we'll move on to the final layer, which is the environment influence on our building. For this, we lay out an additional standard set of UVs and use a constant textile density across all UDIM tiles. We recommend to use constant tile size. We did not do this where we had some tiles in our UDIMs which were 4K and some were 2K, which becomes difficult to track as the textures go between different departments. So we recommend you choose one size, say 4K, and have every image in your UDIM be that size. Also, thoughtful layout of UDIMs can be used to pass information into materials. For instance, on the right you can see that we've broken down our materials into stone on the bottom, painted materials in the middle, and glass on the top. So now that we have our UVs, we can go ahead and bake some textures. First we bake a set of utility signals per module that include multiple AO distances, curvature, world space position, and other signals. We process these utility signals in a DCC and output our environment masks, which we then pack into a single texture. We pay attention to how these signals behave near module borders because we don't want neighboring modules to have sharp lines between them. We also can use a low texel density because our details will be added in the material. So here you see our crevice occlusion, edge wear, drips, and broad occlusion. This makes up our packed environment mask. Every building module needs one, so there are 2,000 of them. Luckily, since this process can be automated, no artists were harmed in the making of this texture. So now that we have our texture, we can continue to build our material. We use the packed env mask with multiple scales of world-aligned tiling detail and macro breakup. We create material functions for all of our environmental influences, including grime and drips. Here's a glimpse at that environment material. You can see that we use material attributes to layer the manufacturing and environmental layers over the base. You can see this by the one spine that kind of travels through the graph from left to right below. We use material functions along this spine to share these layers between different materials. For instance, here's our drips material function in the upper right. So let's check back in with where we are. We started here, and now we're here. Just a reminder that aside from the precise UVs needed for the block details, everything else you see here is handled procedurally. No hand painting, no placing decals. Here's a glimpse of where we are with our building material at a few different scales. So let's go ahead and give ourselves that last check for our environment layer of our material. Now that we have our building material, we need to assign that material to all of our instances. We start with the global material at the top level, which is the parent of everything below. We then add instances at the global level to set parameters that might be changed across every block material in the whole show. We also add an instance to set the kind of textures, for instance, limestone in this case. And then we add another layer, which sets a color. We then add an instance at the building level. If we wanted to change the color specifically of CHJ, we would address that here. There are 18 of these, one for each building. We then add an instance at the kit level, which allows us to make changes per floor of buildings. Finally, we have an instance for every module in which we set the specific environment packed texture that we need to use for that module. There are over 2,000 of these, one for every building module. So, with this many modules, one might ask, how do we get all of this data into the engine? We've automated this process by using an asset ingest editor utility widget. This widget relies on a rigid source folder structure for FBX and PNG files. It then provides the actions of importing static meshes, textures, building material hierarchies, and assigning textures to material instances. Once we completed our building material and began to examine it when we put it into the world, we noticed there was a bit of a disconnect between the bottom of the buildings and the sidewalks. We addressed this by building a flat skirt mesh for all building modules. These meshes were then placed procedurally by the building generator prop system. So let's move on to our window interiors. Here you can see an example of what we created. The technique we employed begins with interior mapping, which is used to fake 3D geometry with parallax on flat 2D cards. On the left, you see some typical interior mapped rooms. These are from Robo Recall. On the right, you can see our Matrix Awakens office interiors, which include simulated 3D furniture and non-uniform room size. So let's compare some techniques to achieve this look. 
On the left, you can see a fake room using interior mapping only, and on the right, there's the actual geometry. If we do a capture of the interior geometry and use bump offset, we get an effect that appears to have the objects floating in the middle of the room, but they still seem rather flat. We can use parallax occlusion to give these objects some depth, but there are still some pretty bad extrusion artifacts. We came up with what we call the 3D print method to improve these techniques. Let's break that down. In the 3D print method, we start from the back and do a bump offset for each layer. We test for depth intersection and iterate forward through slices, and then we dither those slices together. The information we need to make this 3D print method work are front and back ortho scene captures, as well as a front and back depth. We combine the front and back depth into a single texture lookup. So here we see our fake room. Remember, that's not there. That's fake geometry mapped on a card against the real geometry on the right. So how can we handle non-square rooms? We place a grid guide into the room encompassing the full dimensions of that room. We then capture the scene and remap the vertices into our one by one by one cube space. We can then decompress this captured one by one room in the material. The great thing about this is this technique works with any size room. Once we have our interior technology squared away, we can move on to a window material that encompasses it and adds more variation. We can control things like room type, light state, temperature, blinds, glass properties, etc. So how do we decide which windows go where? In order to have an understanding of what the building is and what, how it's laid out, we author this room data in Houdini or a UE plugin and pack it into a 32-bit unsigned integer. We have flags for all the information the material needs to figure out what type of room to render in a window. We store that room data as per instance custom data for each instance in a building ISM. Then we consume this room data in the window material using HLSL to unpack and reconstruct each bit field. Once the look of our building started to shape up, we turned our attention to the roads. We started our road development using a single tiling asphalt texture. You can see here that that has some obvious problems where we can see the repetition. Our texture cell bombing material function helps us break up tiling repetition by altering the UVs within the texture cells. Its source is the cell texture you see at right, which is a colored Voronoi noise pattern, as well as the edge detail between those cells. So again, here we see our initial attempt at tiling asphalt. And here it is with our cell bombed asphalt, which basically removes all of the tiling repetition. Then we add some rubble to our asphalt, followed by cell bombed grime, cell bombed cracks, patches, tiling macro variation, deferred decals, and wetness. One of the issues we noticed when we added our wetness layers was that the wetness was showing up under the decals. The way that we fixed this was to set the decal response to none for the road material node. Then, in the material, we could use the apply debuffer node to composite the debuffers into the material under the wetness layer at the appropriate point. Here is our road material with the features I've outlined, as well as others such as the ability to add lane markers and to deal with intersections. Getting the road wetness to look right was one of the biggest challenges of this material. We used many inputs to get a natural looking water pooling effect. This required two UV sets, vertex color information for blending problem areas, as well as a variety of lane and vehicle textures and manipulations of UVs blended with noise to achieve our final result. Here are some images of our completed road material in the world. So let's turn to rooftops. Our wave function collapse rooftops are modular. To avoid the UV nightmare, we use world aligned projected textures, but some buildings are not XY aligned, so we need a way to keep the roof grid and line details aligned with the edges of the modules. You can see here that as we rotate the building, the grid lines on top of the roof stay locked to the roof surface. We accomplish this using a Z-rotation aligned world space texture projection. This projection sticks to the rotated object's orientation, but freely tiles in X and Y. 
We do this by calculating the actor's Z orientation and then rotating our absolute world space by the calculated amount. Here are the material nodes for that technique. So let's change gears and talk a little bit about our dynamic global illumination and reflection technology we call Lumen. Here you can see a scene with Lumen activated. We immediately notice the effects of all the light hitting the building facade and bouncing back toward camera. We see that indirect light produces soft shadows under the vehicles and is responsible for all of the light under the freeway. We also see detailed reflections on the vehicles. Here we see the same scene with Lumen turned off. Lumen on. Lumen off. We like to say that Lumen helps us light the shadows by providing real-time GI and reflections. This was very important in our world since we often have buildings blocking the sun, we had wet road reflections, and we have plenty of highway overpasses that shadow the sky where there is no direct illumination available underneath. Lumen has also been extended to support huge environments. It has a massive view range which is accomplished by tracing to mesh instances at small distances and tracing against HLOT at greater distances. Here we see Lumen operating at city scale, where a shaft of light on a building is clearly taken into account in the indirect illumination of a building all the way across the street. One of the most important parts of Lumen is that it is dynamic. It instantly updates, so you have no lighting builds, you can change your time of day, you can have moving cars, characters, and destruction that are all computed and taken into account as the light is bounced around and the reflections are calculated. When this project started, one of the ideas was to have a night mode where we would illuminate the city, not by the sun, but by many practical light sources. Using Lumen for night mode was a happy accident which was discovered while exploring the world with the sun and sky off. It became clear that lit only by millions of emissive window meshes and no place light sources, Lumen was able to propagate that lighting in a realistic way to give the city a nighttime look. And finally, Lumen uses hardware ray tracing on consoles, which allows high quality reflections where characters are represented. I hope this talk has helped you understand how we used Unreal Engine 5 to create the world of The Matrix Awakens. As this undertaking was very much a team effort, Jerome, Vach, and I would like to extend our thanks to all the talented individuals at Epic who contributed to the work you've seen here. Thank you for watching.